My name is Mark Anavan. I'm with the New Mexico Educational Retirement Board. We're the teacher's retirement plan of the state of Texas, or not of the state of Texas, state of New Mexico. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they have significantly more assets in Texas. First, I'd like to thank the founders of Trusted Insight for having me here today and for trusting me to talk. And to say uh, thank you to uh, Ian Floyd and Elton Shadula, I think is how you pronounce his last name, for shepherding me through this process. And uh, I'm here to discuss, as you can see, oh, I need to turn that on, don't I? If I hit play from the start, does it actually give 10 seconds per slide? I don't want that. So I'm here to talk about portfolio diversification and real asset allocation. Um, in this first slide, you can see some of our assets, actually. On, on the far left corner, upper corner, that's Cortina. We do uh, real estate, timber, agriculture, and other assets. The uh, middle one on the upper column, or upper row, is uh, the Carlsbad desalination plant, providing roughly 8% of San Diego County Water Authority's water. That's a nondescript forest shot from the internet. This is um, um, some blueberry operations we have in outside a, oh, I can't remember the exact township in, in Georgia. This is a nondescript picture of some oil wells that we don't own, but we are in oil and gas and a lot of midstream. And this is a restoration project that was pivotal in the largest restoration, uh, river restoration in the history of the United States, which is the Blackfoot River. And uh, a friend of mine who, uh, became a friend of mine, I should qualify that, after uh, we financed his project to go forward. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of our real assets program, uh, give you an idea for finding sustainable opportunities in timber and ag. And frankly, I'm not sure who put the word sustainable in there. I'm not an expert in sustainability, in case you wanted to hear that today. We have done a lot of sustainable things. We've done some of the most environmentally levered investments in the United States. But I'm not an expert in sustainable ag, just so you'll know. And they're generating returns from mitigation banking and a look forward to the future <coughs> and where, pardon me, I see inefficiencies in the real asset markets going forward. But first, I'd like to address an issue. I was part of a three-part series of interviews of myself for a Trusted Insight in a magazine they have, and they were very courteous to let me go through that experience. However, one of the articles came out with this. Real estate, how I avoided the financial crisis earned 50% in IRR. And when I first saw that, I went, oh God, I'm a tool. I can't believe it. And I look like a tool. And, and so anyway, I wanted to correct this a little bit. And to let you know, um, there was a couple of events two years apart from one another. It's true in the state treasurer's office. I got us out of all of our asset-backed securities, which are very short-term in nature. They were short-term money market asset-backed. And so I got us out of that um, before the financial crisis hit, because you could see that trend coming. And then I realized after this, that's the best call I'm ever going to make in life. And I should probably leave on a high note. So, so I saw it for another position, and I got hired by my CIOs here today at the Educational Retirement Board. I got hired to run real estate originally, and I showed up, and I told Bob for a month or two, I think real estate's a bad idea. I've had this experience at the treasurer's office. And so we did infrastructure first. And then roughly 18 months later, we started doing well, we did a debt deal six months after I got hired, roughly. No equity. And then we put a boatload of money into Lone Star, which is distressed debt, which is where that 50 IRR came from. So I just wanted to kind of qualify. It's not like we got out of this and I shorted the market and made 50 IRR. But uh, and, and just to uh, say one last thing about it, that I've had some pretty stellar losers, too. I don't have a negative 50 IRR. but. I do have a negative four on the books. So from there, any MRB's real asset allocation is defined as real estate, infrastructure, timber agriculture, mitigation banking, energy, minerals, and mining, and water, which means I'm pretty much not a specialist in any of those, with the exception of perhaps mitigation banking and water. Um, we do have specialist experts in our program, specifically for energy and for real estate. 
<coughs> and for infrastructure. So this next slide will show you some of why real assets are a good thing to do in your portfolio. Essentially, um, they have low correlations, or, or I'm sorry, positive correlations with inflation. So real estate, when inflation's kicking in, real estate normally would. There's a good positive correlation with inflation with energy and minerals. Infrastructure, the nice thing about infrastructure is not only is there a good correlation to, to, uh, uh, to inflation, but it's also highly defensive. So when we showed up at Educational Retirement Board and I, I, I convinced Bob, let me do infrastructure first. Um, that was a great call, frankly. I mean, it, it didn't get hit as bad as the real estate markets had. Had we gone headlong into real estate, that would have not been a happy day. So instead, we went headlong into infrastructure, which has been highly defensive. I'm not going to say it's been a great performer for us, because we were performing in a pretty stressed market. But over time, it's done what we've wanted it to do. Then in the timber and ag category, timber and agriculture are incredibly defensive. I don't know if anybody was watching those markets during the downturn. But if you had, you'd have seen that timber was flat, depending on how you executed your strategy. And agriculture uh, actually had single and double digit returns right, down, right through the downturn. It's really impressive. Unfortunately, that's one of the bigger mistakes I've made is I took two years to figure out this agriculture thing because I guess I didn't understand the utility of eating all the time. So, <laughs> um, but since then, I did a lot of research and a lot of study on the demographic demands nationally. And nationally is not that impressive, but globally is very impressive. As there's more income and wealth distributed across the planet, it, if you're only earning $3 a day, it's not incredibly difficult to double to six. If you're earning $200,000 a year, it's pretty hard to double that. So in the United States, if you do have a significant increase in income, you're not looking at buying a better steak. You're looking at other type of things to do, luxury or leisure or whatever. The rest of the world, a doubling in your income means you go from eating very basic gruels to going up the protein ladder into nuts and into meats. That's a tremendous multiplier effect on the requirement of agriculture globally. Because to make a pound of meat takes a tremendous amount of grain and a tremendous amount of water. So that's why I believe personally agriculture is a very long-term play, highly defensive. Um, you need to know how to enter the space. And you don't want to just be, um, you want to be beholden to commodity aggregators, put it that way. You want to have some kind of value add in your program. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Oops, did I go backwards? Yes, I did. Now, for everybody who, everybody in this room knows that's his allocations of modern portfolio theory. So I thought I'd put up the correlations. Now, there's problems with this chart, significant problems, but <coughs> pardon me. I have a bad cough. It's, it's a life thing. So um, you can see here Timberland with slightly negative correlations to REITs, core, non-core real estate, positively correlated with farmland. Um, and, and you can see the other negative correlations embedded within this chart. They're fairly impressive. The problem with this, and I, I want to I wanna bring up the problem with these charts and with the basic concept of asset allocation. Asset allocation is great. We all need some kind of plan to follow. We all need some kind of model, some kind of guide. But life doesn't tend to work on our plans. It happens to be somewhat happenstance. So I wanted to go through these charts and then point out some of their errors. <coughs> and then we'll go from there. So the problem with this is the energy proxy is very difficult to define. I mean, if I remember right, we use the Standard & Poor's, Goldman Sachs, GSCI to do energy. We used uh, Morgan Stanley's Capital Index to do mining, liquid commodities. I don't remember. But bottom line is, all of those 
are public markets. They're not private. The amount of data available, and I'll go to the next slide, the amount of data available, for example, the infrastructure. We started doing infrastructure in 2008. There's no data out there. Um, so most of the benchmarking is done around the United States. Hmm? Oh, did I? OK. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm not used to doing this with a click. There we go. So let me go back to this before I start trashing the data. Um, <laughs> this is a chart. A friend of mine uh, runs uh, the real asset program at TIACREF, Jose Manaya, great guy. And he let me use this chart. So this is from their own internal numbers, as well as the data gathered. I'm, I don't remember where they gathered the data from. But <clears throat> these are better numbers than most. So here's 100% traditional portfolio. I've never seen a traditional portfolio with only 11% stocks in it. But the idea was allocation representing highest risk return based on a sharp ratio over the 91 to 2015 period. So you see here uh, what that portfolio looks like and what the sharp ratio looks like. And then adding only farming, because they have 42% there. Um, and the sharp ratio looks great. Adding only timber, 1.05. So it illustrates the importance of real assets being added into your portfolio. But again, I wanted to get to some of the issues involved with the benchmarking of the asset. Oh my gosh. Benchmarking of the assets and, um, and some of the issues to deal with asset allocation decision making processes in real assets. Because most of these things, when we did infrastructure, literally it's anyone's guess as to what a good proxy was. Nobody had really aggregated any good statistics. I'm part of an industry group, trade group, editorial board for a magazine. And a group of us, 12 of us, large, very large pension plans doing infrastructure, all requested one of the largest data aggregators in real estate, who I'll just say it's NACREF. <clears throat> and we were all willing to donate our data to try and build an index. And I, I don't think we've heard back from them. So, <coughs> um, and so that's how, my point is, that's how difficult so, and you can see some of the problems why it works for traditional assets. Those, you can read the slide later if you'd like. It, it's probably available to people, right? Or is it not? I'm assuming it is. But here's why it's limited. Private real assets lack comprehensive data sets. Um, they're not consistent. How they're reported is not consistent. The long-term series of, of, of data isn't there. For example, I did mitigation banking. Most people in this room never heard of mitigation banking. And my consultant had the audacity to say, well, it's inversely correlated. And I said, really? How much data do we have? Where is the data? There wasn't any, none. Well, there was about five years with four different mitigation banks. So that poses a really big problem when you're creating a portfolio, but I'll get to that in a bit. So I wanted to talk about that, actually, my problems with some of these issues, or with some of these concepts. Asset allocation is very important. I very much believe in creating a plan. I very much believe in having a pacing plan, allocation targets, and doing everything you can to inform yourself. But life tends to work, and it ha or my life anyway, I don't know about yours, um, has happened rather happenstance. So I'm going to start. I'll go back to the treasurer's office. I realized, I mean, to give you an idea of how we actually built our portfolio, I'd like to give you a silver bullet that says, put this much in that, and that much in this, and this much in that. But the problem's going to be, there's only four mitigation bank platforms in the market. None of them are raising money now. The people who are raising money in private equity, uh, oil and gas, you may not want to have anything to do with currently. In those kind of issues, the supply issues, timing, who's coming to market, who's not. So that makes it a different type of process. So I get uh, to Education Retirement Board from the State Treasurer's Office. I start investing in infrastructure. Um, wow, five minutes, bummer. And um, 
Oh, that threw me off. Uh, we we uh, started in, in investing in infrastructure, finally started doing distressed debt because my consultant adapted to me. And then I got shown some mitigation banks. Now, I've never been an environmentalist. I've never done any environmental investing. But the individual mitigation banks I underwrote showed significant possibilities to generate an unlevered return that's just unheard of. So um, we went into legal negotiations with them. We didn't finalize the deal. We had approval to be able to go forward with it. But we didn't. In the meantime, I then started looking for funds that could actually deliver on a mitigation banking type concept. And I'm going to skip forward because I've been told I have five minutes. Um, so we started doing mitigation banking. Uh, and, and that was the first fund we did. Then shortly after that, we started doing equity investments in real estate. And then I eventually realized what I was doing in agriculture. So now I wanted to talk about agriculture. The problem with agriculture is when we started, there were four or five monolithic managers, one of which you didn't want to do business with. Well, yeah, you would, but they, I didn't find the returns very compelling. Um, but there was just very large managers. And then after that, there was people who had $50 million in AUM or $100 million in AUM. And so first we did, I'll just say it, Hancock. I mean, you can look. It's all publicly disclosed on our website. Uh, separate accounts so we could have control over it. We didn't want to have some manager investing going crazy, putting money into row crops into Indiana. Uh, Row crops had gone up, 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 up for years. <coughs> and we wanted to do a more value-add type of approach. By having a separate account, you can control how that money is deployed. Um, the other nice thing about it is um, fees are lower than a net regular fund. But the problem with that kind of, uh, of, of that kind of approach is it's a $50 million minimum. So some people can't do it. So there's other reasons why you're going to be constrained. You may not be, want, be able to deploy 50 million at a crack, or um, you may not feel comfortable going in with a bunch of small managers. But there are four or five big names out there. Tia Kreff is really frustrating. I would negotiate with a small manager to do a very niche investment, and then they would acquire them. And so, <laughs> so they built this great platform. Um, uh, but we never got to invest in the, the little groups we were looking at. So what we wound up doing over time is approaching another group who never had a fund, an actual fund manager, did due diligence on them and hired them to execute for us, which was one of our second investments. The other important thing about agriculture is trying to capture part of the vertical, trying to capture more of the value chain. You don't want to be beholden to Cargill. You don't want to be stuck selling your product to one large commodity aggregator. So we also did a fund investment, it's vertically integrated. We have a pecan investment with it, a co-investment that is, uh, has the sheller, has the marketing, has the, the dryer, and, and all the growths. I'm going to skip past timber and go straight to mitigation banking because I don't have much time. So mitigation banking was enabling legislation with 72 and 73 acts, the Clean Water and Endangered Species Acts, if I remember right. And uh, then there's further acts there. In 2008, there was a rule uh, promulgated under the Department of Interior, no, Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA, I'm sorry. And um, they basically said, we want preference given to mitigation banks. So now let me explain exactly what a mitigation bank is. Because of the Clean Water Act and Endangered Species Act, when I grew up, You'd see people putting up Walmarts all over Florida or Burdines or whatever other uh, shopping mall. And then all of a sudden, they'd put up the shopping mall. And there'd be a pond in the back with a fence wrapped around it. And it was qualified as a protected wetlands. I kid you not. Because when the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act were passed, you had to offset your damage to the hydrological in impacts of the area. So all of a sudden, you have a hydrological impact. You have to offset it. People were allowed to do one-off projects of creating little wetlands, and it qualified to, to offset your damage to the environment. Well, over time, people realized this is not the best solution. Basically, what we've done is created a mosquito farm and an eyesore. And 
And over time, uh, a great idea came up, which is why don't we let somebody restore 1,500 acres in the same watershed, and we will allow them to sell, we'll issue credits to them, and they can sell those credits to developers to offset their environmental damage. Great idea. Um, for several reasons. One, it actually has ecological uplift. I've seen a lot of the projects that were one-off projects that were done by developers in Florida and other places, and they're not really a lot of ecological uplift. Um, but a 1,500-acre bank actually has impacts on the water of the area, the hydrology of the area, and the species in the area. It's actual real uplift. Um, and anyway, I want to clip to this real quick, since I'm already going past my time. This is Nevada Spring Creek in Montana. It was a pivotal restoration done, pivotal in the sense that it was needed to be done to uh, finish the largest river restoration in the history of the United States at the time, which was the Blackfoot River Project. When they made the film, A River Runs Through It, there were no fish in the river. There are now. A friend of mine, Fred Danforth, became friends. I bankrolled him after seeing this project and some other projects. I shouldn't say I bankrolled him. Education Retirement Board bankrolled him because I don't have that money. <laughs> but we re recommended it, and it was approved. And here's what his ranch, he bought the ranch, um, Spring Nevada Creek Ranch, um, what it looks like after the restoration. And to give you an idea, Fred was an investment banker, had his own firm, went to retirement, bought this ranch, restored it, realized, oh my god, I've spent a lot of money. And Needed to, to, uh, he needed to recoup some of it, and he realized he could finish the restoration by selling these credits. That then gave him a great idea, well, I could start a fund. So he created three proof of concept banks. That's about the time I met him, because I was looking for mitigation banking opportunities. Here was a guy who'd been a capitalist. He'd run his own private markets firm. He had a mid-market firm. He had run funds before. <clears throat> He's a fly fisherman but he also knew how to do mitigation bank. So we were able to get him approved at committee. And make a long story short, that fund is generating, where is it? We've restored 77 miles of streams so far, over 26,000 acres of wetlands, planted over 900,000 trees, actually it's approaching a million trees, and it earns a net, net, gross of all fees, 15.26% IRR unlevered. 